Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Martin C. Jiski Hall of Biomedical Engineering and the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, just to note, there is an overflow room in 2001 upstairs if you choose not to stand, but uh, that, that is absolutely up to you. Uh, this series was started two years ago as part of our 150th uh, anniversary celebration here at Purdue. Uh, to bring outstanding academicians and professionals to our campus uh, to engage our students and staff and faculty in thought-provoking conversations uh, all around grand challenges in both science and engineering. Now, in addition to this much-anticipated presentation, we'll have a panel session uh, up in room 2001 uh, immediately following, uh, where we bring together a, a number of scholars uh, in the field uh, to really look ahead about what our world will be like uh, with advanced optical technologies. I, I'm now uh, delighted to uh, introduce to you Mark Lundstrom, the Acting Dean of Engineering and Cypress Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Purdue. Uh, Professor Lundstrom is both an outstanding teacher and mentor, uh, uh, and uh, as well a renowned scientist in the area of physics applied to electronic devices. Uh, he was the founding director of our NSF-supported NCN, uh, the, the uh, Network for Computational Nanotechnology here at Purdue, uh, and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So please give a warm welcome uh, to Dean Mark Lundstrom. Yeah, thank you, George, and good morning, everyone. It's my very great honor to introduce our speaker, Professor W.E. Murner, the Harry S. Mosher <laughs> Professor of Chemistry at Stanford. Uh, before I introduce W.E., I just want to add a few words uh, about this seminar, this very special seminar series that we're conducting here at Purdue. The Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series brings a prominent scholar and intellectual leader to campus every month. Uh, th the visit includes a distinguished lecture, such as the one we're about to hear, a panel discussion, which will follow this lecture. Uh, panel discussions are always interesting and thought-provoking. Uh, it includes extensive interactions with faculty and students, and I know our students have been preparing for some time for Professor Murner's visit, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, W.E. Murner was born in California, but grew up in Texas. He did his undergraduate uh, education in the Midwest, at Washington University in St. Louis. He received his BS in electrical engineering with top honors, his BS in physics with top honors, and his AB degree in mathematics, summa cum laude, all in 1975. He's still a ham radio operator and a member of the IEEE, so I can, cl I can claim him as an electrical engineer. <laughs> okay. Uh, W.E. then studied physics at Cornell and received his MS and his PhD, his MS in 1978 and his PhD in 1982. At that time, the U.S. was fortunate to have a number of great corporate research labs. Uh, W.E. joined IBM Research in Almaden, where he was encouraged by his IBM managers to do the best science possible, and he began the work that would lead to the Nobel Prize. As corporate America changed in the early 1990s, IBM Research did too, and that led W.E. back to academia, first at UCSD and then at Stanford, where he has been professor of chemistry since 2002. He's the recipient of many major awards, uh, including the Wolf Prize in Chemistry, the Irving Langmuir Prize in Chemical Physics, and the Peter Dubai Award in Physical Chemistry. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, He's a 2014 recipient of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on uh, super-resolved fluorescence microscopy. And today, he'll be speaking about super-resolution microscopy in cells. So please join me in welcoming Professor Murner. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Lundstrom, for that wonderful introduction. 
Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, I want to begin this uh, wonderful event for me, uh, the, the, uh, the honor of being able to present this uh, lecture. I want to thank uh, Professor Fang Huang uh, for doing so many things to organize uh, my visit. And of course, the entire engineering school uh, for, for you know, allowing me to come. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. So we're going to talk about single molecules, individual molecules, uh, which is a combination, really, of engineering and science, physics, <coughs> chemistry, applied to biology. So you need to be ready for uh, moving from field to field during this presentation. Uh, and I'm going to be making sure, hopefully, that there will be something interesting for everybody to follow. And I'm happy to explain uh, specific things later in the questions. But first of all, our uh, roadmap uh, for today uh, is, is shown here. It's really been 30 years, actually 31 years, since the first experiments. Uh, but we're, we're going to start with that early days. I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, original uh, discovery and, and observation of individual molecules, because that's what everything followed from afterwards. Uh, super resolution microscopy is one of the favorite applications, but it's not the only one, but I'll describe it briefly. Uh, and then talk about new work, because uh, the question here is, of course, what's new? So uh, we've been doing some low temperature localization microscopy with single molecules to provide annotation of cryo-electron tomography images. So that's a very new uh, uh, step forward that we think is interesting. Uh, I'll then talk about three-dimensional imaging, uh, where we use point spread function engineering uh, to get the, the third axial dimension in a two-dimensional microscope and uh, talk about a specific tilted light sheet microscope that utilizes point spread functions in a nice way. There's a number of applications that I won't have time to talk about, uh, uh, applications to specific biological systems, uh, but I'll, I'll mention them along the way. And then at the end, uh, for some more fun, we'll talk about neural nets, because we've been utilizing neural nets for analyzing uh, single molecule images recently. So uh, starting with uh, that historical uh, summary, very briefly, if you think back to the mid-1980s, uh, there were beautiful experiments on single atoms in a vacuum trap, but no single molecule experiments. And uh, so we detected single molecules in 1989 when I was at IBM. It was a, a technique that utilized quantum limited laser frequency modulation spectroscopy. A beautiful technique, uh, but I, I don't have time to describe. But why did this happen at IBM is sort of more interesting at this point. We had the ability to do fundamental research in basic science, exploring an application uh, to optical storage, to use molecules and solids, and to uh, write bits in the frequency domain. So uh, there, were, there were these things called spectral holes, which are marks in the wavelength of the light used to illuminate a sample. And you can imagine putting thousands of bits in one location by using this frequency domain. But the, uh, the real uh, important point is that I was interested in the signal to noise ratio. I was interested in what is going to limit our ability to, to detect a small uh, spectral feature. So that, that represents, uh, in a, in, in equivalently, asking this question. Uh, think about pentacene molecules in a crystal of paratrophenyl transparent, and this is the electronic absorption of pentacene molecules, billions of molecules. And so uh, you can see that it's, it's got a certain color, but this is an inhomogeneously broadened line where we were going to write 1,000 bits uh, in, the, in the peak of this line. So it was important to know whether this was a smooth line. If you spread it out at high resolution, is it just a horizontal line or not? Okay, That's the signal-to-noise question. And so we set out to measure what it really looked like, and we found this. Uh, we found an amazing spectral structure now, very, very high resolution, um, low temperatures, single frequency, one megahertz the line width lasers are required to measure this, uh, and it, it's not noise. If you measure this once and then measure it again in the same uh, piece of sample, you see the same spectral structure. So this is coming from the molecules piling up, individual molecules absorptions piling up in a certain way. And uh, so we called it statistical fine structure because its amplitude scaled as the square root of the number of molecules in resonance. Think about that for a minute. You know, most uh, spectral features scale linearly with the number of molecules. You put 10 times more molecules, you get 10 times more absorption. This is a feature whose amplitude changes as the square root of the number of molecules because it's coming from that uh, statistical effect that I just described. So because we could see this, uh, in, in answer to that question above, it also led me to think, well, maybe we can detect a single molecule if we can detect these peaks. 
Uh, and in fact, you only have to work a square root of n harder to get to the single molecule limit. Think about that for a minute. You don't have to work n times harder, just the square root of n harder. <laughs> okay? So that's why uh, we used FM spectroscopy in 1989 to, to, to detect single molecules. Uh, and it sort of started that this field. Now, there was a, an explosion of interest uh, in, in detecting single molecules, and they, everyone switched to fluorescence, which was very important, uh, because you could also detect the molecules by recording the emitted fluorescence. Uh, and, and that turns out to give better signal to noise, but it wasn't the first method. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that important step by Michel Aurie uh, caused uh, a, another uh, rush of wonderful people moving into the field, measuring every situation they could think of for single molecules at low temperatures. But what really matters for uh, thinking about the whole field now is what were the really uh, important surprises that occurred? We started seeing at low temperatures that molecules would blink, they would turn on and off, or they would move in frequency space, even at 1.2 degrees Kelvin in a crystal. Uh, interesting science, of course, people thought, oh, well, these molecules are not very stable, they're not very interesting. But this is the beginnings of what's going to come later when I talk about uh, single molecules used for super resolution. We could turn molecules on and off optically. Uh, and those were very important surprises that weren't really expected until you started doing experiments in the single molecule regime. Then the field moved to room temperature in the mid-90s. Uh, and a lot of people showed that you could detect single molecules even at room temperature by many different microscopic methods, uh, near field, confocal, wide field, two photon, and so on. And uh, so that's all wonderful. It just means you have to be more careful about re lowering backgrounds uh, because now you don't have the, the narrowness and the strength of the absorption that's true at low temperatures to help you. But nevertheless, surprises also appeared at room temperature. We, we started looking at a single copy of green fluorescent protein. And the first time we saw that, we saw it was also blinking on and off in, in a random sort of way. And uh, it, so that's an important step, but so again, some people thought, well, this is not very interesting. What are you going to do if, there's, if the molecules are, are unstable in some way? So you'll see that coming back uh, in a few moments when we start talking about super resolution as well. So uh, the, the room temperature experiments that we do, just to make sure everyone's on board uh, in terms of the techniques that uh, we utilize and mostly, uh, work basically like this. You, imagine you want to see a particular, uh, let's say, protein or uh, oligonucleotide, and if it's not natively fluorescent, we attach a fluorescent label to it, usually. Uh, th that's these kinds of molecules, uh, small molecules, a couple of one to two nanometers in size is one possibility, rhodamines, cyanine dyes, or whatever, or you can also attach a green fluorescent protein to the object of interest. Uh, but the point is, once you've done that, now you want to pump and collect the emitted light from those single molecules. And what we're always doing in these experiments is pumping electronic transitions of the molecule and collecting emitted fluorescence shifted to long wavelengths. Right? Usually you avoid dark states like triplets and so on, but that actually is a source of the blinking that we're going to utilize later. Uh, so <clears throat> the uh, ex experiment, you can think of it as focusing a laser down to a small spot, but you, you may know that due to diffraction, you cannot make this spot infinitely small. It cannot be smaller than lambda over roughly two times the numerical aperture of the microscope. Numerical aperture is about one. Uh, so this is the diffraction limit of visible light if you're using, let's say, 500 nanometer light, green light. And uh, so that is a fundamental property that's coming from physics, uh, coming from diffraction itself. Uh, so you might say, well, that's huge compared to the size of these molecules, but no problem. You can still get to the single molecule limit. Just dilute them. Just make sure they're further apart than the width of this spot so that now the emitted light is coming from just one uh, molecule being pumped. Okay? So that's the kind of thing you have to do at room temperature uh, to, to get to the single molecule limit. But we'll solve that problem in a moment as well. Thinking of this regime and just giving you an example of what happens in this regime, especially since we went to room temperature, what happens if you look with a wide field microscope and look at a big piece of a sample? And, you, and this is a, cr a cell uh, where the, uh, a transmembrane protein has been labeled with a fluorescent uh, label. And we see uh, this wonderful, exciting uh, measurement. And I still love this measurement, even though the, you know, the, the imaging and the codec is not so beautiful now. But this is quite a long time ago, right, this, this particular measurement. I love to watch those molecules 
uh, on the surface of the cell. Because again, you know, you may not have realized this, but the, the molecules on the surface of the cells in your body are doing this now, even faster, because this is, this is about 22 degrees C. Yours are moving faster. This is the native motion of individual molecules on the surface of your cells. Uh, and uh, that, you know, you very quickly realize that, that motion and diffusion and uh, randomness, Brownian effects, are, are uh, important uh, in, in, on the biological scales uh, and to make things work. And I, I'm showing it again and again because there's, there's uh, so many interesting things in this movie, sorry. Um, <clears throat> one more time. Also, note that the molecules uh, don't look like infinitely small dots. That's the diffraction limit that I just told you about. They look like a spot that's about 250 nanometers in size, uh, and you see them disappearing. Some molecules are going away. That's photobleaching. Uh, molecules give us maybe a million photons before they give up. Some special cases, of course, can do better. But you, you, you see that we have to live with those finite number of photons. Everything that we do becomes a, uh, a, an estimation challenge. How do you learn as much as possible with, with a finite number of photons, so, and so on. So now, the, the next thing that's important to recognize is that uh, because you could start doing that, uh, observing individuals and removing ensemble averaging, uh, many, many scientists all over the world uh, started applying these methods. Let's look and see what happens if we watch them one by one. How do they behave? Do they all behave the same? Do they behave differently? Uh, do, is there heterogeneity? And of course, there certainly is, and I apologize for this laundry list, but it's just to, to kind of uh, emphasize that so many interesting things have been done uh, at, at room temperature and at low temperatures uh, to just look at individual molecules. It, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, there's applications to biophysics and cell biology. There's applications to photon antibunching. Uh, and so on. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to look at these sort of ultimate individual objects um, and ask questions about a complex environment, whether it's a, a polymer or a cell or other sorts of interesting situations. So <clears throat> now, uh, if you think uh, about these kinds of measurements in a different way, I want to kind of tell you a little bit more about what we can learn by measurements on the single molecules. First of all, uh, remembering that uh, we have this diffraction limit. Even though we have a very tiny emitter, its spot looks large, and now I'm showing you like a two-dimensional representation of the image on the camera. Uh, that's the diffraction limit defining the width of that spot. And what uh, many people do, a, a very important thing you can do is to localize the molecule, find out where it is. Uh, and you do that by uh, fitting a model function to this measured data from a, from a, a camera. Uh, and then the model function will have as one of its parameters the center position or the location of that molecule. And the error uh, in determining that, that position has a much smaller uh, error distribution. Okay? So, uh, and that error distribution scales as 1 over the square root of the number of photons. So this, this previous uh, limit, that's the uh, Abe limit, uh, can be reduced if you have a single molecule because you can localize it much better. If you get a, if you get a 10 to the fourth photons, then it's 100 times below the diffraction limit. Uh, is the precision for where you can find the molecule. So this is all great, but it only, and, and that's the regime where much of that previous work I just showed you was, has, is being done. Uh, <clears throat> but it doesn't give you resolution. This doesn't give you the ability to distinguish two molecules that are very close together because these spots will overlap, okay? So that's why uh, super resolution is, is, a, is a step beyond just localization. Uh, and so for super resolution imaging, what we do, and I'm going to, I'm going to describe it fairly quickly because I, I think many people already know this, uh, what we do when we have many, many molecules potentially overlapping, we use the fact that you can turn them on or off. We use the fact that they either blink or we can photoactivate them to make the concentration be very low in any imaging frame. If you make sure that there's very few in any imaging frame, then you can localize them by the normal method, by, by this method up here. And, and then you can uh, uh, get information from the samples of the underlying structure from multiple images. So another way to say that is, suppose I have this structure here and I've got floor fours all along it. If I just do a diffraction limited image, I'll see big blurry features. 
But if I can go to this individual molecule limit at low concentration, enabled by active control, the experimenter has to actively pick a, a way to make sure most of the molecules are off at any given time. Then in each imaging frame, I can localize, and the next imaging frame, I'm going to get a different molecule, different molecules. The, the, the different emitters are imaged at different times. So this is, if you like, time domain multiplexing of learning about the positions of the molecules in a complex structure. Uh, and then you take all those positions that you've recorded in the computer and show them all at once. So the final result is a reconstruction uh, of the underlying uh, structure that was beyond the diffraction limit before. So it's, it's a fascinating way to use that sort of blinking business and, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, now, what, what are people also still doing? They're also tracking single molecules, so let's not forget that. Uh, this works for a, st a static structure, essentially, that's static on the time scale of this measurement. Uh, but you can also uh, just watch an one single individual where that same individual is being observed at different time points and get a precise trajectory of the motion uh, of, of that, set, that molecule, for example, in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm or in other interesting structures where you'd like to learn about uh, the behavior from the motion. So these, these approaches uh, let us uh, now observe structures and motions beyond the diffraction limit. In 3D, you can also measure orientations of molecules. That's another fascinating thing that, that basically comes from polarization measurements. So you can see what the direction that the dipole, the transition dipole in the molecule is oriented. Um, you can look at uh, properties of the local environment from the emission. Uh, is it, does it have a, a short lifetime, a long lifetime? Uh, things like that. And uh, the size and charges of objects can even be sensed in single molecule measurements. So um, that's kind of this big overview uh, of, of, and now, given that we can do this super resolution imaging, okay, uh, once again, a large number of people uh, have uh, jumped into this area and are utilizing super resolution microscopy in many different systems. And uh, uh, once again, I cannot possibly summarize everything that's done in this field, but to just give you a few quick examples, uh, here's the, the, uh, an interesting observation uh, in the Zhuang lab um, at Harvard. Uh, they, they were looking at neurons <clears throat> uh, and a particular protein in the neuron spectrum and uh, discovered that there is a fascinating banding pattern perpendicular to the long axis of an axon uh, that hadn't been observed before. That's below the diffraction limit and so on. Uh, it's, it's, it tells you something interesting about the structure of the axon. Here's uh, something from uh, Feng Wang's uh, work. Uh, this is the, the synaptonemal complex uh, imaging with, with super resolution. Uh, here's an example that relates to amyloid diseases. Uh, this is the Huntington protein inside a cell. Uh, mutant Huntington will form aggregates and fibrils. There are these really huge, large uh, inclusion bodies, but we also find it fascinating to be able to see with super resolution these very, very tiny fibrils. Uh, that are all around, scattered around in the cell. Uh, and so there's a number of people that, that are applying these methods to different kinds of um, important questions that relate to amyloid uh, formation. And then the, this last quick example is an image of the glycocalyx. Now, what's the glycocalyx? It turns out that the surfaces of our cells are decorated with many interesting sugars. Uh, the glycocalyx is the general term for these glycans that are, that are on the surface of the cell, uh, forming interesting structures and so on. Uh, and especially in cancer cells, uh, this, is, this is a cancer cell, uh, there are these, these tubules extend out from, from, the, uh, from the cell membrane, uh, and they're decorated uh, with these sugars. So if we image the sugars and the positions of the sugars using a fluorescent label, we can see with super resolution their shapes and sizes and so forth, and then follow that as, as cells go through a transition into a cancerous form, uh, and et cetera. So there's just uh, so many interesting things that people can do now with, with these kinds of uh, approaches. So uh, since, uh, as I said, I can't summarize this whole field uh, uh, by myself, then uh, what I'm going to talk about now is some of the new things we've been doing um, that uh, are designed at pushing super resolution forward, pushing single molecule measurements into other regimes. So I'm going to talk about going back to low temperatures briefly. Uh, I'll talk about in, in a little bit more detail how we do our 3D imaging. Uh, and then ex explain this tilt 3D microscope. 
Uh, I showed you this already, so I'm not going to go a lot more into that, but I'm, I'm instead going to spend the end talking about how you use neural nets uh, on, in this whole problem. So um, I hope that you uh, <clears throat> can follow me through these different sort of descriptions of, of really new work. Well, uh, as, a, as a, if you like, a motivation for this next portion, I'm going to talk about uh, super-resolution microscopy, which is an optical method, and combine it in a certain way with electron microscopy, which is a related and a different method. Uh, but we, the, the way to talk about this work is to <coughs> go back to this beautiful drawing by David Goodsell of what's inside a, a bacterial cell in this case. Uh, there are so many interesting little machines and proteins involved here. Well, uh, people can look at this uh, with electron microscopy, which has very, very high spatial resolution. But what you see in, for example, cryogenic electron tomography, that's the one where you take many, many tilt images and so on and try to look at a thicker uh, sample, instead of just looking at one protein at a time, looking at the whole sort of cell, you see uh, a grayscale image. You see an image of the density that's there. Uh, that's what the electron microscopy is giving you, it, it, certainly in high resolution, but the problem is you, uh, you don't know which structure is which if it's, if it's just all a grayscale blur. Uh, now, uh, on the other hand, we know that you can see single molecules, like I just said, and localize them to, to, that are specifically attached to a specific protein. So the idea here is to combine this cryogenic electron tomography and single molecule fluorescence, localizations. Then what you can do is, uh, if this advancer will work, then you, will, you uh, would have the, uh, the knowledge that those particular positions in the cryo-electron microscopy image were those specific proteins that we had labeled by, uh, and, ob and observed by light. So uh, that's why we call it, we're going to call this single molecule annotation. So um, this needs to, this then requires that we do our optical microscopy uh, on a sample that's a cryogenic sample that can be immediately sent to a cryo-electron microscope. So uh, that's the challenge here. We, we need to do experiments on cells that are on an electron microscope grid. So Peter Dahlberg, my postdoc, has been uh, pursuing this interesting project. Um, so the workflow for all of this uh, involves, uh, first of all, uh, you have cells that are fluorescently labeled, and we typically, uh, right now, are using a particular fluorescent protein called PAMK. It's just another one of these huge menagerie of fluorescent proteins, but it's one that works at 77K, because we also found that many others don't work at 77K. What do I mean by work? I, I need this active control scheme. I need to be able to turn the molecules on and off. Because if they're all on, then I won't be able to get the uh, super resolution information that we'd like to have. So PAM Kate, we learned that that works and published that recently. So here's some bacterial cells that have been labeled. You have to uh, plunge freeze uh, a solution of the cells on an electron microscope grid into liquid ethane. That produces vitreous ice. It freezes the water so fast that it doesn't form a crystal. It stays transparent. And it's a, it's a way to make sure that you haven't really perturbed uh, the system very much, even though you've cooled it down. Then uh, we take that sample into the optical microscope. So here's, here's the electron microscope grid. It's in liquid nitrogen. And all the imaging then is done uh, in that environment, uh, but done in the usual sort of way, with a pumping laser and an activation laser and collecting fluorescence from the sample, just like before. Okay, then uh, that sample is taken over to the, uh, the electron microscope and, uh, um, and measured, uh, if you like, with electron tomography. And then those images have to be combined. You have to figure out how to register and visualize uh, the electron microscope image and the information from the optical image together. Okay, so this is, as I say, the work of Peter Dahlberg that uh, has been pushing this uh, in my lab. So uh, I want to tell you an example uh, of how this works. Uh, from our one of our favorite organisms, uh, Colobacter crescentis. Uh, Colobacter is a uh, bacterium that's been studied for decades by our friend uh, Lucy Shapiro at Stanford. And the uh, idea is, and what's interesting about it is that this organism divides asymmetrically. This is a pre-divisional cell, so you can see that there is a stalked form and the, another uh, daughter cell that's forming that has a flagellum. And so in, as the cell cycle goes forward, you, you have stalk cells that can start dividing, but then you create swarmer cells and leave a stalk cell behind. You have two different daughter cells, even though it's a small bacterium. So that's fascinating. How does it work? What, how does this happen? How do you program this cell? That's the, been the key problem that's been under study for a really long time. 
Uh, and so uh, I want to use this as a model system to, to prove our technique by uh, focusing on just one part of the cell, this uh, region called the chemoreceptor array. Uh, this is uh, a, a set of proteins that sense environment and say, okay, if there's a lot of food or so forth, then we're going to uh, now begin our transition from a swarmer cell to a stalk cell, for example. But th all the details of that are not important. Just, just remember that if I think of that structure and do an electron microscope image, uh, an electron tomogram slice, you see that there are these two lines here uh, close to this inner membrane. There's all these other membranes. Don't worry about that. But uh, you can see the uh, chemoreceptor array right there. All right? It, you, so it's an example of something from the electron microscope image that you can, you can recognize. Okay? Uh, and so that's why we wanted to use this. You can recognize it both in the uh, uh, electro, electron microscopy and I'll show you in the, in the optical microscopy. So um, this chemoreceptor array uh, is composed of certain proteins, but, <clears throat> gosh, I wish I knew why this doesn't advance. Um, if anybody knows, tell me. This is a Logitech. Uh, so it's supposed to be made of MCPA proteins and other proteins, but let's look ask for the MCPA proteins. Can we find them? Can we see them optically in this chemoreceptor array? And so uh, we image overexpression of the protein MCPA fused to PAMK, our photoactivatable fluorescent protein. And these images look like this. So on the left is the diffraction limited image. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's some white uh, images. That's just the uh, entire cell lit up in another way. Uh, the, the fluorescence I'm talking about is this orange and red. It's near the end of the cells, as it's supposed to be. You saw it. It should be near the end. But we need a much better localization than this uh, diffraction limited image. So if you then go to the single molecule limit, you see uh, this uh, beautiful individual spots, and you're going to see more of them turn on as we activate more fluorophores, and then you'll see them ultimately turn off, and you'll see things like that. But notice this is at 77K, and this is 100 times sped up. These molecules are not blinking fast. Uh, they stay for a long time, and that's why we're doing this, actually. If you have a long time and less photobleaching, you get more photons and therefore better precision for determining the position of the molecules. So that's, that's the idea here. So these molecules get localized uh, by fitting and, and, and measurements. And in fact, there's, there's, uh, the long on times will lead to not only high precision, which is good, but possibly also overlapping PSFs, which is not so good. I say PSFs here because that's the image of a single molecule uh, informally. Uh, and so we have to uh, work hard to deal with overlapping PSFs. And of course, there's theoretical approaches that various people have have presented about uh, dealing with overlapping PSFs. But in, in this case, since we can see the emission from one spot go up and down digitally, we know that there's a molecule that turned off at this point, on and then off in this time period. So you can take the, the light underneath it and call that a background and subtract that background and fit the, the photons from just one emitter. So th th you can see that this is very clear. There's an estimate of background, emitter plus background, and then you get the emitter alone and can fit the emitter alone. So uh, <clears throat> once you do that, uh, for every frame, then uh, you get these small black dots. Those are the localizations for each frame, OK? For each frame, each one second long frame. But it's the same molecule for many, many frames. So we should combine the information from all of those localizations. And so that's what this uh, circle is. That's the average location of, uh, over all of those uh, individual frame localizations. And now we can use these measurements to define its precision, the uh, statistical precision, by the radius of that circle. So the bottom line, you get information down to the few nanometer level of where this protein is by this method. That's the idea. So now, uh, in this case, it happened to be 12,000 photons, so nine nanometers. But there's, there's uh, a number of cases where it's five and even down to one nanometer. So what do we do with this data? Uh, now, after all that registration business, you put it on top of the cell, and you, you see that uh, there are many spots that are close to this uh, chemoreceptor array uh, in the electron microscope image. Uh, and it's, it's sort of fascinating that uh, uh, many of them are there. And note, by the way, that our optical images are above and below the plane of, of this electron microscope image, because this is just one very, very thin slice. Uh, and you might say, well, what's going on over here? There's a molecule very far away. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it, right? <laughs> uh, there very well may be a molecule over there that you, you uh, because no, there's no rule that say all of them have to be in the array. 
you, you synthesize these, they move around in the cell, they have to find their location over time, uh, but mostly they're, they're in, in, the, uh, in the proper location. So is it in the chemoreceptor array? Yes, of course, and, and we see a clear correspondence between the single molecule annotations, as we call them, and the, the CET density. Great, so that is uh, a known structure, but we can also apply this to unknown structures, to structures where you don't see a clear pattern uh, in, in the cell. And the example here is a, is a uh, molecule called uh, POPZ, which is in the, uh, sorry, it's, it's in the polar region. It, it forms sort of a uh, micro environment uh, near the poles, the POPZ does. And so uh, it's not easily seen in the electron microscopy images. So what do we do then? Uh, well, we observe singles, and here's a, an example of the data of, of, of blinking molecules and, um, that are all used to, every time a molecule comes on, we localize it and put it in the image. Here's the electron microscope image uh, of that same region, and uh, you can see that you know, the, here's one of the cells and here's the other cell of, of two that, were, that had divided. And uh, if you now take all of this electron microscope image uh, information, what people normally do is that they like to annotate electron microscopy images. They, by hand, start marking out things that can be observed, okay? So that is how you can localize and say, well, you know, you can see these membranes, the inner membrane, the, the uh, peptidoglycan layer, the outer membrane, and so forth, and you see all these dots. These dots are all coming from uh, ribosomes. Ribosomes are large and big black blobs, so you know which things to mark as ribosomes. But remember, this is hand annotated, and some people use neural nets to do that too, but they train the neural nets by having people you know, pick out these spots. Uh, and that's fine, so it gives you, you know, a, a fancy dancy image that you can rotate and so on, but what about all the proteins that are not annotated? That's the point here. There's thousands of proteins that are not annotated, and that's why we're looking at these optical experiments to try to annotate uh, those that are not easily seen. So this, this zeroes in on this region near the pole where there's no ribosomes, uh, that's the, the, the feature of, of POPZ. It excludes ribosomes. So the ribosomes stop, and there's something here, but you can't annotate it in the electron microscope image. So, uh, and that's, that's sort of showing that as a blow up. It's this uh, region free of, of uh, ribosomes. So <clears throat> I'm now drawing the void, okay, the region where there are no ribosomes, all right? And then on top of it, you'll see the localizations of single POPZ molecules. Uh, so now uh, we're, we, we can show that you can util use this method to say where are the molecules that you can't identify easily in electron microscope images. These are also shown in, with a 3D information with this cross structure because we also get a little Z information from this microscope uh, using astigmatism. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an example of what you can do with uh, single molecules now to try to push into an, an effect and improve another uh, class of, of fascinating uh, measurements. Um, great. <clears throat> so now let's go back to the main thread of uh, thinking now about uh, no electron microscopy for a little while. Uh, but let's talk about three-dimensional imaging. <clears throat> Because, of course, the world is three-dimensional. Uh, for example, if I'm thinking of the motion of a protein on the surface of this bacterial cell, if I only measure the two-dimensional projection of its motion, I'll get a very distorted view of the motion. Uh, any, any motion that's in the axial or Z direction is basically lost if you only do a two-dimensional image. So uh, that, why is this a problem and how do you fix it? Well, what you have to do is um, think about the microscope. Think about the light going through the microscope. There's, there's a number of different solutions to this, but I'm going to talk about our way of doing it. Uh, for a conventional microscope here where, where the object is moving in the Z direction, uh, you see that at one position it's in focus and you see a nice tight spot, but uh, then you don't see anything uh, after that. It, it, it goes away very quickly, and in fact, at the focal plane where it's brightest, it changes slowly. So that, that means its fissure information is very poor. Its derivatives are zero when you're right in focus. So uh, this is not so good for determining z position. Uh, so we've been switching to a different kind of microscope where we uh, alter the optical behavior of the microscope uh, by placing a phase mask in the Fourier plane of the microscope or the back focal plane in between the objective and the tube lens. Uh, this particular phase pattern, which looks kind of crazy, uh, came from very nice work uh, by uh, Rafael Pistun at the University of Colorado. Uh, it is uh, 
really uh, only a map of phase delays, okay? Uh, and so these different colors mean different uh, numbers of radians of phase delay at different positions in the back, back focal plane. The, this particular phase pattern converts the light from a single emitter into two spots, two spots on the camera. And more importantly, as you uh, move the object in Z, if you have different uh, emitters at different Z positions, then you see that these two spots revolve around one another. So that now I can encode Z and the angle of the line between those two spots. So that's what this is all about. It's a way to get Z by uh, encoding the information in the image of the, of the single emitter. Uh, and this is uh, important to know that this works over two microns, over a long range in the Z direction. The previous performance of an empty microscope only worked for 500 nanometers or 600 nanometers right near the focus. This works over a longer range. So maybe we can use that. We'll think about that later. And then I, I also want to emphasize that we don't do any scanning when we use this performance, th this response. We don't do any scanning. You don't have to scan anything. Uh, it, just one image will show you all the molecules within a, a slice that's two microns thick. And it tells you what their Z's are by just these lines between the two, the two spots. So you get X, Y, and Z for this whole thick little pancake, okay? So uh, that's the basic idea, and this works great for doing uh, th super resolution microscopy. Here's a two color case, 3D, using the so-called double helix point spread function. We call it the double helix because when you think about it, uh, like, in, in terms of the mathematics, it's kind of like a double helix along the z-axis. And the images are slices through this double helix. That's what all these images are, these pairs of spots. So um, this is, a, of course, another wonderful example of the cleverness of my students. Uh, here's, here's Matt Liu and Steve Lee, uh, where they've got a new acronym called Spray Paint now, uh, <laughs> which is just, of course, for fun. Uh, the first part of it is super resolution by power dependent active intermittency. So what's that? <laughs> blinking. So fancy, fancy term for blinking, right? Because you need blinking molecules to do all this. And so anyway. Uh, uh, <laughs> So to, to make one more important point about these uh, point spread functions, <clears throat> uh, they are useful uh, on the one hand for super resolution. That means measuring an extended structure where you use some blinking to get all the different molecules. Uh, or you also can use them for motion. You can also use them at the single molecule regime uh, by uh, just use, having a low concentration and following just one. You see this molecule is an RNA particle inside the protein, inside the cell that's moving around over a time of nearly 35 seconds, 36 seconds. And you see that the angles tell us X, Y, and Z for that uh, whole time period. Okay, so very useful for that too. Well, uh, <clears throat> Now, uh, what do you do uh, when you want to go uh, graduate from uh, thin, small, little bacterial cells to mammalian cells that are much thicker and so on? Uh, then uh, you want to do something important to remove backgrounds because if you just illuminate a thick cell in wide field, you'll have haze from all kinds of molecules that are out of res uh, uh, not in the focal plane, okay, that are, that are out of focus, so to speak. So um, this is uh, solved in many different ways, but we want to solve it for the wide field problem. So we've been, uh, of course, using something that's well known called light sheet microscopy. Uh, the idea is just to illuminate with a thin sheet of light. Uh, imagine a pancake of light coming in from the side of this image to illuminate uh, that sample. And so that uh, is going to only il illuminate one plane. And so the, there's no background from above or below the plane. So this, uh, I list all these pioneers and so on. But I, I, I want to point out a difficulty with many light sheet designs. Uh, think of that cell, and here's our light sheet that's coming in from the side. So think of a plane that's, that's uh, slicing through that cell. Uh, you have a problem if you want to get down close to the cover slip uh, when you want to look at the bottom of the cell because that will badly distort the light sheet due to, due to this corner of the, of the chamber that's holding the cells. So um, we are solving this problem just by a trivial solution, a simple solution. Just tilt the light sheet. Just tilt it maybe by only 10 degrees. And you might say, well, how's that going to solve the problem? Well, uh, this maybe you might think this produces difficulties because there's molecules that are out of, out of, out of focus and so on, uh, above and below the focal plane. But because our, our point spread functions work over that long Z range, that is not a difficulty at all. Uh, <clears throat> so that tilted light sheet uh, 
lets us, in a very simple way, uh, implement light sheet uh, performance uh, if, we, if we combine it with our, our special point spread function. So this just shows how simple the microscope is. There's just one cylindrical lens and it's making the light sheet that's going through the sample. Because we've tilted it, the, now the beam is going through the, the flat part of the side of the sample cell, so it, it is not distorted. And then in the collection path, we, we make a, what's called a 4F optical processing system, well known in optical processing, uh, to produce a Fourier plane, which is where the phase masks are placed. And we can either use the double helix phase mask or another one I haven't mentioned yet called a tetrapod, which is a new design that works over a longer range, even 6 microns, 10 microns, even 20 microns. Uh, so uh, it, it is, we're using that for a special reason I'll talk about in a moment. So anyway, this so-called tilt 3D microscope is a simple way to get uh, the uh, 3D information uh, from a cell, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and here's an example of uh, my mitochondria uh, that, that are uh, measured in the cell by blinking, by, by so-called storm, uh, it's molecules that turn on and off. But let me just make sure I emphasize how this really works. Uh, how this really works is to think of it, this experiment in the following way. Uh, suppose we place the light sheet here at this lower position. Uh, remember there's molecules that are going to be pumped that are above and below the focal plane. But that's no problem in the detection path because our double helix response will tell us what their Z is by the angle between the spots. So we, we get a Z from the PSF, the point spread function, not from the precise position uh, of the light sheet. Once you've finished with those cells, you can go to the next uh, position of the light sheet, but, and now you're going to see that you get sort of the same images for molecules, same thing for another position of the light sheet. So how do you patch all these different positions together? You do that with this other point spread function, the one that works over a longer range, the so-called tetrapod, because we can use it to image a bright bead that's uh, stuck at the cover slip. Now, no matter what the focal plane position is, we can tell how far we are above, above that focal plane just by looking at the images of the tetrapod. So it's a long-range PSF that gives the connection between the different double helix slices in this microscope. Okay? So uh, it beautifully uses these uh, interesting behaviors uh, of these point spread functions. So <clears throat> um, uh, Anna Karen Gustafson, who is the, the postdoc, has been working on this, uh, and she'll soon be a, an assistant professor at, at Rice, uh, uh, applied it to the nuclear lamina, which is a, a, a fabric uh, of proteins uh, that are close to the inside of the nuclear membrane. Uh, and so by uh, imaging lamin B1 uh, and, and doing uh, blinking single molecule uh, storm microscopy, but with all of this uh, 3D tilted light sheet, uh, she was able to obtain these images. Let me just emphasize that uh, the double helix is used for each plane, and then the tetrapod is used for the long range. Um, th this is something that you can get from double helix optics, and, and my disclaimer is that I'm on the advisory board of, of double helix optics. But uh, these uh, data in, in three dimensions are really quite beautiful of the nuclear lamina. You can see uh, a, an intranuclear channel inside this cell, uh, inside the nucleus, running across the nucleus. Uh, those were known before, but now we're observing it uh, with uh, super resolution microscopy in 3D over a, a long range. Uh, so uh, again, I, I want to say that this is our particular approach to 3D. Other people use other techniques and different, different, uh, different kinds of, of, uh, of imaging, but this is just to show what can be done with these point spread functions. So that's mitochondria, here's the nuclear lamina, and now this is applying this to the glycocalyx again. I, I mentioned it briefly, but here I'm now showing the, this, these tubules in 3D above the surface uh, of a cell uh, using this tilt 3D microscope. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I, I now want to switch gears one more time. Uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, imaging and microscopy and applications and so on, but I haven't really gone deeply into every application and I apologize for that, but it always takes a long time to explain the biology, you know, the setup for any one give, given problem. Let's talk about uh, something else that's very new that just came out very recently, uh, a neural net that we've used to uh, solve another kind of problem uh, for our, our kinds of imaging. So this is the work of Leonhard Merkel, a postdoc in my lab. Uh, and the idea is to think hard about this estimation problem of where the molecule is. Uh, so here's that image of a single molecule I sort of showed before as a 2D uh, camera-like uh, representation. Uh, 
uh, and in one dimension, you can see that uh, here's where the molecule is. You can see these are the pixels where the molecule is located. But all of this around on both sides is what we call the background. Uh, this is not uh, something coming from the detector alone. This is light that's coming from the sample uh, that, that is typical in all of our measurements. We, we typically work to, the, to, the, to uh, uh, have enough sensitivity to be background limited. If you want to reduce the background, you make the best possible samples you can, but there's going to always be some source. For example, uh, autofluorescence or other sorts of sources of fluorescence that might give you a background. And you want to estimate the position of the molecule in the presence of that background. So that means that the point spread function itself are, uh, in our experiments is contaminated partly by background. Even though you have a known model for the underlying shape of the point spread function, this fitting has to be done carefully so that you're not confused by the background. So, uh, and, and the background itself can distort the positions of the molecule since you want to get them precisely as, as much as possible. So how do we correctly account for background set fluorescence? So let's think of this in, a, in, in a number, uh, several different ways. First of all, uh, the PSF shapes uh, are the molecule's emission alone, and the background shapes are coming from whatever, okay? But those two combined could cause a problem. So this new neural net called BGNet looks at this problem from the point of view of treating these two as, let's say, good data on the left, the point spread functions, and bad data on the right, the background uh, signal, background shapes. So since we know what's going on on the left, we know the point spread function, we know theoretically from vectorial diffraction theory what it should be, including phase retrieval to, to uh, quantify it, we can calculate what the shapes should be for molecules at different positions for different degrees of, of, of distances from focus or distances from a cover slip. So that's all known that can be provided to the net. And then for the background, we're going to challenge the net with a bunch of simulated backgrounds. Uh, coming from something called Perlin noise. And so the, the that net is trained to, get, to figure out what is the difference between these two and give us the background back from a single image. So, uh, so in, this, in this way of doing it, the background estimation is not an isolated problem. So to make this all work, uh, just, to make, just to make sure you understand the, the workflow, uh, we're going to train on, on known PSFs with some simulated background and ask the net to say what is the background. Okay, in that case, you give me the background alone. Then you can take that background and subtract it from the measurement to give you just the PSF alone for fitting purposes. So uh, this is done with a UNet. I, uh, I'm not going to go through all the details. It's, it, this is one of the networks that's been used for a number of different image processing applications. Uh, it's a deep neural network that's trained uh, on, on many, many examples of point spread functions with a lot of backgrounds. Um, let me uh, uh, emphasize that this Perlin noise is could pretty cool because uh, you can simply use the Perlin noise rule to compute uh, random backgrounds, but notice that they cover many, many different spatial frequencies. That's the really important point here. We've solved the problem for not just low spatial frequency in the region of interest, but also high spatial frequency in the region of interest. So uh, other methods of removing background only work in a limited regime, let's say only low, uh, only low uh, a spatial frequency, for example, but these fancy PSFs have much more detail at high, free, high spatial frequencies. That's why we have to be able to remove the background at those high spatial frequencies. So uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the performance of this net for uh, an open aperture or the standard PSF. So this is what a molecule is supposed to look like, but in fact, in, in a real measurement, uh, you see it with background, you, you detect it with background, uh, this, of course, this is a simulation just to show you how well it works. This is the true background that was added to the PSF, okay, to make that image. And uh, the uh, net uh, extracts this as the predicted background. Uh, so you can see how close the predicted background to the background that was added to the image. Uh, so to, just to emphasize, the net gets only this, and it gives you this back. And you see it's very close to the true background. The res residual is very small. And so if I use, if I subtract the uh, image from... Uh, the, the true background or the predicted background, I, I see basically only the PSF. Uh, it also works for these more complex point spread functions, double helix and tetrapods. So uh, in the case of double helix, just look here. Here's the background for this particular test. Here's what the net produced back. And here's the image minus the predicted background. And for the case of the tetrapod, the same thing. Uh, here's uh, the co corrupted PSF plus background, but here's the background that was added to it. Here's what the net gave us back. So you can see that this uh, very, does a nice job of removing structured background. To uh, demonstrate it one more time, uh, 
to show you uh, how this works in a real sample. Uh, this is an imaging problem where we're looking at cells, but now I'm showing you uh, an example of one frame from, from the movie of single molecules. Uh, you see that there's very bad structured background in this image. Uh, individual molecule uh, PSFs are corrupted by that background in different crazy ways. So if we use uh, the, the net, then we can uh, uh, analyze uh, images of microtubules uh, that come from the super resolution measurements. Uh, and this one is uh, taking the data of the single molecules and just using the most common uh, method of removing background, the constant background. Just assume it's constant. And I'll subtract a constant, so I fit with a PSF plus a constant. And uh, that's, that's what you get from that method. The old method here is using uh, the BGNet to uh, subtract the predicted background. You can't see anything unless you look up, of course, much more closely. And in these different regions of interest, you see that the BGNet uh, does a far better job of, of uh, showing you what the microtubule images look like compared to using a constant background uh, as the model for, for the fitting. Uh, and the same thing is true for all these other, uh, other regions of interest. So we think it's an important step forward uh, to be able to estimate structured background. Uh, important for this particular experiment, but possibly useful for many other areas of science. Uh, so I've given you sort of a whirlwind of many different things, uh, history, uh, 30 plus years, uh, lots of different kinds of measurements, both at low temperatures and in cells, so the biology, all combined together. Uh, and now uh, connecting that back to some uh, sort of, if you like, engineering kind of uh, considerations of images uh, and even uh, neural nets for processing. So I want to thank my past students and postdocs and collaborators. Uh, here's the, the, so the current team and some of the people. Um, uh, you might see that uh, we call ourselves the, uh, the guacamole team. Guacamole. What's a guacamole? Well, you know, it's one over avocado's number of moles. <laughs> That's it. That's what we call a single molecule. Thank you for the uh, polite laughter. And uh, I, uh, I want to uh, thank our funding agencies, which have supported this work. Uh, and we, we have a little uh, no ensemble averaging logo here that uh, we, we sometimes use. Uh, and once again, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very, very much for your attention. mentioned in the beginning that you measure the lifetime of a single molecule and can you elaborate a little bit more on that this may be a mm -hmm. very interesting mm -hmm. sure uh, when we have a single molecule we can uh, pump it with a pulse laser and so if you then uh, measure the time delay between the pump and the detected photon then you can produce a histogram of those time delays which gives you the excited state lifetime so that is done in other measurements, not, not so much in these that I've shown, but we do it regularly for single molecules in solution that we've trapped by our ABLE trap, our anti-Brownian electrokinetic trap, a completely different sort of device that I didn't uh, describe, but we have a machine that lets us suppress Brownian motion for single molecules in solution, even down to one fluorophore. And uh, so that those objects were, that were, in terms of science, we're almost always looking at uh, photosynthetic proteins, which ha are pigment protein complexes that have a large number of fluorophores coupled by energy transfer, and so the lifetime is a very nice reporter of what's going on uh, in, in, in a complex emitter, okay? Is that what you were after? Yes, yeah, so uh, is that possible to track uh, the lifetime of a single fluorophore? Yes. So you mentioned that multiple fluorophores form a complex. Oh, yes. You can still do it with one fluorophore. Oh, yes, sure. Yes. Thing is, you just keep getting the same answer for the most part. <laughs> but even the single fluorophore, when we trapped a single fluorophore, it showed changes in brightness and some changes in lifetime. So this was the, the work of uh, Tren Wang, one of my uh, wonderful uh, postdocs who, who took, did a little work on, on, on that particular regime. Um, w, I had a question about uh, for, for, for live cells, um, 
um, how, how accurate are the measurements if one wants to go into the organelles, like for example, phagolysosomes and lysosomes and look at what kind of reactions are happening? Is that uh, doable today? Uh, yes, and in, in, in every case, when you think about uh, you know, how accurate is it going to be, you're always going to be answering that question based on trade-offs. Um, and uh, one of the things that I didn't, didn't show you, but I'll show you very briefly now here without going through all the biology. Uh, this is, whoops, what happened here? Where did it go? <laughs> I had it for a moment. Um, if I, yeah, we should be able to see this if I'm able to turn it on. Um, these are live cells, and, and they're the bacterial cells again. And there's a specific protein that's been labeled that's part of a regulatory pathway. So all the details I'll leave out. But this is a situation where uh, we're observing the motions of individual copies inside the cell. Uh, this is done at about a 20 millisecond time interval. So you can see uh, by the coloring of these trajectories the, the motion, okay, as a function of time. And when uh, these, these are, these are uh, placed at equal time points. So when you have uh, uh, here out on this particular molecule is a transmembrane protein. So you see it uh, in the membrane and you have to show three different projections since it's in three dimensions. But this motion is uh, slower out in, away from the pole but faster close to the pole. Sorry, I'm backwards. This one's faster <laughs> away from the pole and much slower in, uh, in the pole. So it slows down in this fascinating polar region. Uh, uh, that's one example of one of these key proteins. Here's another one that's cytoplasmic, fast in the cytoplasm, very slow when it's moving inside the pole. So th this paper uh, just appeared uh, in uh, Nature uh, Microbiology. Uh, but it's a study of the, both the motions as well as the positions. And so now uh, the, the, the most important answer is if I'm looking at dynamics, I tend to like to go to the single molecule regime. Now, there are some people, uh, especially the Buersdorf lab and, and work uh, that was done by Wang and so on, to image very, very quickly, to try to do the full thing of blinking and recording and blinking and recording many, many images as fast as possible. And that's a beautiful tour de force kind of measurement that uh, allowed you to get even to video frame rates uh, with a detailed structure. But here, I'm, I'm uh, really trying to look at individuals and see how they behave relative to some other structure. So that's, that's a regime where you will trade off. If you want to get much, much more precision, then you have to wait a little bit or force the photons to come out faster, okay? Turn the laser intensity up and, and use that uh, finite um, uh, set of total photons that you get in a, in a slightly different way. So anyway, sorry for the long answer, but milliseconds are easy, okay, or, or, well, or generally done. And there are a number of processes where milliseconds can tell you that there's interesting changes in motion already occurring. Let's save the remainder.